Himalayan kingdom of Nepal. The new king recently assumed the throne, just days after a palace massacre. Suddenly, the future of the nation rested on the shoulders of an untested ruler. Many Nepalis lived their lives a world away from royalty, in villages perched among the highest mountains in the world. They say Nepal is a vertical country with six directions. North, south, east, west, up and down. The capital, Kathmandu, lies in a fertile valley at the foot of the Himalayas. Walking through its streets is a constant reminder of ancient kingdoms and religions. Prithvi Narayan Shaw founded the current royal dynasty in 1769. From his palace at Gorkha, the charismatic leader conquered the diverse peoples of the Himalayas and created Nepal. Nepal has been a constitutional monarchy since 1990 with a parliament and democratic elections. But the throne remains the seat of power. The current king, Gyanendra, has held power for just three and a half years. <laughs> Nepal is the world's last Hindu monarchy. The king is worshipped by many as an incarnation of Vishnu, a powerful Hindu god. So many people still believe if the king touches them, they'll be cured of their diseases. When things really start to go wrong, that's where they turn. The people guide the kings. The challenging part for, I think, any king would be to live up to the expectations of the people. They have always come and told me, we expect you to guide us. Behave like a father figure. <laughs> palace gates will open for a long-awaited celebration. Princess Prerana, the king's only daughter, will be married. The groom is Raj Bahadur Singh a wealthy commoner who studied computer science at UCLA. The elaborate Hindu ritual spanning four days will unite him with the princess. My daughter, she's chosen her bow, she's chosen a groom. I think the entire nation joined in wishing her the best in her married life. Despite the joyous mood, Nepal and the royal family are just emerging from a cloud of tragedy. For many wedding guests, just being in the palace is a sad reminder of the day the royal family turned against itself. June 1st, 2001. It is the reign of the previous king, and the royal family is socializing at one of their regular gatherings. The crown prince, Dipendra, enters the room armed with a semi-automatic weapon. I saw the first two bullets strike the king, and a lot of people say he fired into the scene. He didn't. He first shot at the king. Crown Prince Dipendra was fueled up with drugs and reportedly distraught over his parents' objection to the girl of his choice. He shot at just about everybody. So, I mean, I knew I'd be one of them. And when I did get shot, I don't, I don't think I realized I had, except I got shot in my left arm and that was right in front of me. And um, that's when I looked down and I saw my shoulder. It's totally shattered. Like... He shot, shot his father, father mother, mother, sister, sister brother, brother, 
and nearly, nearly a dozen, dozen others. others. At, At the, the end, end of his rampage, rampage he shot himself. himself. Within a few hours, the king was pronounced dead, along with eight other members of the royal family. Crown Prince Dipendra, the man who shot them all, lay in a coma. Its royal family almost destroyed, Nepal now faced the greatest crisis in its modern history. In Nepal, the bloodbath at the royal palace is only hours old. With the king assassinated and his killer, the crown prince, in a coma, the situation seems surreal. There was a great shock. There was disbelief. Can this happen? Even now, I think, is it possible? In the Hindu tradition, the bodies of the royal family were carried through the streets of Kathmandu. As his family members were cremated, the palace was planning to follow the rules of succession. With the blood of nine people on his hands, and still in the coma, Prince Dipendra became Nepal's new ruler, a murderer king. Why he would declare a man who shot not only his father, the king, it's high treason. It doesn't matter whether you are a son or you are a wager in his hotel. How did he to proclaim him king? I have not understood. You, you must, must not see the throne empty, empty even, even one, one minute. minute. Because, because then, then you can have, have civil wars. wars. That's, That's why, why it's, it's never, never empty. empty. The, king the king dies, dies you have, have another. another one. It was, it was quite bizarre. bizarre. Everything, Everything was bizarre. bizarre. Uh, but but this, this was the more bizarre thing that had happened. The defender was still in a coma. He wasn't dead yet. So until he was dead, he'd be king. So we had this strange situation where we had three kings in four days. Dipendra died within 36 hours. Next in line for the throne was his uncle Gyanendra, who was crowned in a hasty ceremony. A prominent businessman who enjoys writing poetry, Gyanendra ascended the throne in a haze of national tragedy. I think that period was very traumatic for the nation itself. For me personally, I lost many dear, revered members of my family. As I had to sit on the throne, I was unable to express my real feelings as much as I would have wanted to shed a tear, the entire nation was shedding a tear in grief. I refrained from doing so in the belief that the people did not expect their king to do such a thing in public. Throughout history, men and women have ascended the throne unexpectedly often on a tide of violence. Now it was Gyanendra's turn. He faced an immediate crisis. Some Nepalis even thought he had played a part in the murders. With rumors flying, violence broke out. The BBC and CNN came out with the news within two hours, and yet our own communication media were silent. People wanted to blame somebody other than the Crown Prince because he was very popular among the people. So there was a lot of anger. And there were mistakes made to say, you know, things like the guns went off accidentally. It was ink to expect them to believe something like that. It was really mishandled. For the last
last three years, Nepalis have been struggling to come to terms with the massacre. Princess Prerana's wedding celebration gave some Nepalis hope that life could go back to normal. I think this was the first occasion where there was joy. And that was what the man on the street also felt. This gave them a boost of saying, well, there are happiness once in a while. Like all royal weddings, this one was a welcome distraction for the country and its king. But for Gyanendra, the holiday was brief. Since 1996, a Maoist-inspired guerrilla movement has infiltrated most of rural Nepal. The rebels are fighting to abolish the monarchy and create a communist state. Nepalis are killing Nepalis. More than 10,000 have already lost their lives. Nepal is one of the poorest countries in the world's poorest region. It's a very, very hard life. And what the insurgency did was made that hard life much harder. Mobility was closed. People weren't able to take the produce to market. Then there was the fighting itself. Rural Nepal has always suffered this neglect and apathy of, of Kathmandu, the capital. Gyanendra had inherited a country battling a fierce insurgency. Convinced that the elected officials were failing to deal with the Maoists, the king took action. He dismissed both the prime minister and the parliament and took executive power. In a sense, a lot of people were quite impressed that someone finally in Nepal took responsibility for his actions. The political parties are no power at all. The reality in Nepal today, there are two powers. One is the king with the security apparatus, the other with the Maoist with their guerrilla force. Shortly after the royal wedding, in their boldest move yet, the Maoists struck in Kathmandu. In broad daylight, they gunned down the chief of police, his wife and bodyguard. So far in the last seven years, the insurgency, as far as Kathmandu was concerned, could have been happening on another planet. I think uh, the assassination of such a high level security force official, as well as his wife, it brought the war home. So that day was uh, tremendously depressing. The stakes were now desperately high. Behind the palace gates, unobserved by the public, a deal was being struck. A ceasefire between the Maoists and the government was announced three days later. The indications we have is that he's a very hands-on king. Anyone who restores peace is going to be rewarded with legitimacy. And I think the king understands that. For far too long, the entire nation has suffered. People have suffered. At the end of every tunnel, there is light. But you never see the light until you walk into the tunnel. You have to move into the darkness to see light. Despite the poetic wishes of the king, the ceasefire and King Gyanendra's problems have only escalated. The king of Nepal is clearly at a crossroads. The best thing he could do was to become a more symbolic presence, which might be just as important. We owe it to the Nepalis who have lost their lives that we take this as a lesson and set things right. For the monarchy to survive, it has to make sure that elections are held soon, 
that there is a legitimate elected civilian government here. It is true that Nepal could probably do without a monarchy, but since it's something that we have already, it's a tradition, it's a symbol of our national unity, it's already there, why not use it? No one has come to me and said, you are irrelevant. No one has come and told me you are a white elephant. <laughs>